born. So it would go up to the age of, what, 20, I guess, when I left for university. But it was, it was a, you know, it was a dull town at the time. Nothing at all. And of course, we lived outside of town. We did not live in Windsor. We lived along the river. My father worked in a factory. He worked at Chrysler's. And um, was paid every week. And then, of course, my mother would wait for him. At the, um, you know, at the, at the door of the factory. On Friday evenings, before he had time to spend his money, she'd be there with her arms folded like this, waiting for him to get out. But of course, you know, once in a while you take another exit, and we didn't eat for that week. But you know what is, <laughs> like, you know, we were really as poor as church mice. But the, with the the uh, when my sister Sue came along, you know, we, my, there was me, my brother. And my sister, my first sister, you know, my older sister, and they were all, we were all in just a year apart. And then eight years later comes the other one. So what we, uh, we always said to, uh, to even to my mother, you know, that thanks for the present. Thanks for the gift. Thanks for the toy. Because we had nothing to play with, but we played with her. We used to torment the poor girl. And whenever my mother would say, don't, what are you doing to that poor girl? I said, we don't have any other toys to play with, mother. Isn't that awful? That's true. And, and Sue remembers some of it, you know. She, even to this day, she says, you guys were awful to me. You used to throw me to snowbanks and, but poor, and then, you know, and I was, of course, very interested in chemistry and that sort of thing. And I had a little lab, you know, in a shack at the back of our house. And, and uh, so I was always inventing ghastly things to do to my poor sister. And one of them was electrocuting her. She was telling me about this on, on the phone the other day. She said, do you remember when you used to electrocute me? I said, but not after, a, it was always after a fair trial. She said, I can still see that rocking chair, you know, strapped with with wires. And then you had two big, you know, batteries at the bottom and a switch. And then you would say, have you any last words? <laughs> and, and she said, I was so caught up in it and so terrorized by all of you that she said, I would say, well, um, you know, I did. Uh, I farted the other day. Aha, that adds to your punishment. So... Poor thing. Oh, it was awful. And then, of course, we throw the switch. <laughs> <laughs> and off she'd go, poof, you know, in a cloud of smoke. Poor Sue. But she still remember and still brings it up. She said, you think, you know, I've forgotten all that, but I haven't. You were really rotten to me. I said, no. Think of how rotten our parents were to us. We had no toys. <laughs> And you were a living toy. <laughs> Fuck all under the Christmas tree. But there you were. <laughs> Poor Sue. Anyway, she's a great gal. <laughs> and my other sister, of course, is quite different. But anyway, she's she's been wonderful to me too over the years. And my brother, who's now now in uh, playing a harp somewhere. Poor guy. That was a shame, you know. That's, anyway, what a life. But that's, that's it. And it could happen to all of us, couldn't it? In a minute. Eh? Hey? What, what, what is it all about? It just goes poof. Anyway, so that was, you know, the usual junk when we were kids with the father who was a, a drunkard and a a violent man. My mother, who was, um, I'm not really sure what my mother was, but she certainly maneuvered through all of that and, uh, you know, kept as much as she could, kept food on the table and all this sort of stuff. But she, uh, she also had her own little, 
her own little agenda. And one wonders, you know, she was always talking about him as being the villain, but eh. she would take, you know, she, she did a few things, I'm sure, that drove him bonkers and unfortunately. But that was it. So after, you know, and then thank God I, I had a chance to get away from get away from home by going to university, and that was that was a wonderful thing. But just before that, of course, I at high school I had met Robert, my friend and mentor, Robert Walton, who was, you know, encouraged me to go along into languages, and literature, even though I was very interested, as I told her. I had my little chemistry set, my lab out in the shack where I executed people. Um, and I really wanted to go into chemistry. And he said, nonsense. He said, no, 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 no. That's just a passing fad. You are definitely, you know, um, a poetic soul. So, and so, on, so anyway, he was wonderful. And that's really, I suppose, why I went and, you know, went at the university, I signed up in for English and French at the University of Western Ontario. So there, that took four years, not only of studies, but I suppose of initiation into life, first sexual encounters, I mean, of any serious import, other than, you know, beating off under the porch at home. <laughs> that doesn't count. Hoping somebody would see you, but never mind. Um, so then, at... Um, at the University of Western Ontario. You know, there are all sorts of things going on. The explosion away from home, the explosion of, of self, I guess. And so there were wonderful things happening. And I met um, I met some very influential people who, whom I still know um, and who have been wonderful to me over the years, sexually and otherwise. And then what else from there? Oh yes, I got a scholarship to go to France. And um, 16 years later, you know, I was still there. But of course, I'm not going to go into the, you know, the French thing. Oh, but Antonio, it's endless, you know. It was a whole lifetime. But you know, I'd fallen in love with, um, with a woman named Elizabeth and she was married at the time that was in London before I left Canada. And um, she decided to follow me over to France. And, but it was very complicated because her husband decided to come over with the children, you know, that they had. So it was very, very, you know, a bit sticky. So she, uh, he, he summoned her, you know, and said, you know, no, you've got to be set up shop in uh, near Bordeaux. And she was obliged to go and live with him. So I saw her on occasion when she, whenever she could escape. And he didn't care. He didn't care about that, you know. Um, matter of fact, I think he was as interested in me as she was. Anyway, this went on for many, many years, you know, and then finally she divorced him. And uh, they, um, set, she set up, you know, she had an apartment in in Paris and I was there most of the time but not all the time I had my own apartment and of course I was living with a guy at the time and um, so I flitted between the two universes that was a closet revelation so this lasted for you know I Oh, I don't know, 12, 13, maybe 14 years of this situation of flitting back and forth between two households and two lovers and so on. And uh, But she was a, an amazing inspiration to me. You know, when I, I started writing uh, poetry, I'd written other things. But when I really wanted to write poetry, it was really for, for her, for her eyes. And of course, for Roberts as well. But. Um, she was, you know, uh, that was, it, she was the one who triggered it all, if you like. And then I would send it off to Robert to see what he thought. Or to Lawrence, who was another great friend of mine from those days. And that's how it, uh, it went on for years. And then she decided uh, at one point that it was just 
She was afraid that the children would be taken away from her by her, her ex-husband. So she decided to leave the country. <laughs> she left France and uh, went to Scotland with the children, hoping the family would kick in some money because she didn't have a bean, of course. And uh, I never, you know, I never, when I look back on it, I never quite forgave her for, for doing that. It was a total disruptor of my life. And I guess that's all that one thinks of my life, not thinking of hers. But she took off and um, we corresponded a bit, but it was pretty, you know, it was not the same thing at all. And then, of course, I eventually, uh, five, four or five, well, no, seven years after that, I left France and came back to Canada, having been offered a, a post at the University of Montreal. So that's what happened there. I came back to Montreal. And um, and here I am. No, 22 or 20, no, 25 years later, I retired from the University of Montreal. And... Um, and of course, just around that time, I was thinking of, well, speaking of, you know, all passion spent, it would be nice to go back and, and see her, see Elizabeth. But I never did. And of course, just last year, January 2000, she died. <clears throat> so that's that. And then her daughter came over this summer. And it was wonderful to, you know, to see her and also to see some of the, um, how can I say, some of the shadows of her mother, you know, there. She was sitting right in this room. But it was like, it was like Elizabeth there often. Quite an extraordinary experience. And I hadn't seen the daughter, of course, for what, 30, 40 years. So it was a wonderful thing. And I thought, you know, that she would um, be a little um, resentful because I, I always thought, and certainly as a very young girl, as a very young, yeah, girl, she she was very close to her father. And I mentioned that to her when she was here. I said, you know, I thought it must have been a blow to you when your father died. And she said, well, yes, of course, but I wasn't very close to him, you know, for many years. And I said, really? She said, no, I think it was because I took, I took Mama's part. I was on Mama's side because he was really not nice. Not a nice man. <laughs> and uh, even though I was very fond of him, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't let him get away with that. I, I took Mama's part. I said, oh, well, that would explain it. Because he was quite, you know, quite a strong man. And of course, he was the one who introduced me to theater. He was a director. He'd, been, he'd studied, you know, he'd produced things in France before he came over to Canada. And, uh, and then he produced plays in, in London, Ontario, when, when I was at university. He was wonderful, terrific. Act, uh, um, actor of course and uh, and of course a director and the, you know his last years were spent in France in in setting up a uh, a theater troupe of his own he he bought a place where he could put on plays and for the last three or four years of his life he knew he was dying he had amassed a fortune and he spent it all not all but he spent a lot of money on this project until he until he died producing plays, acting in them, directing them, and just having a, something he always wanted to do all his life. He was a remarkable man. And so was, are his children. And of course his wife. <laughs> oh well. And then, voila, now I'm back in, um, after that I came back to Montreal. Once in Montreal, you know, that was, um, Gee, must almost thirty years ago now. Um, and uh, you know, I started at the University of Montreal uh, as an associate professor at the time, and um, it was pretty. It was pretty strange because the the very first year uh, that I was here, I, I met somebody who was the, a chap that I'm still with, a, a very close friend. And lover, and um, he's still with me uh, after, well, 30 years. 
And that was that very first year I was here that I met him. And over the years, you know, we've developed a very fine, I think, very fine relationship. I was going uh, going home to, um, you know, Windsor, Les Bains. But isn't that wonderful? Because you have these wonderful, you know, cities in France, you know, Aix, Les Bains, you know. And, and I had to dignify Windsor with something because it was such a hellhole. Windsor, Les Bains. And uh, I'd met him in that just a few days before I was taking the train. So we were just, I was just walking in the street and saw him and uh, he said, uh, hello. <laughs> and uh, it was amazing. I thought, oh, it's just one of the usual sort of little, you know, encounters that one has. Um, but I did say, well, I'm, I'm have to leave and, uh, but maybe see you after. And he said, yeah, sure. So I gave him my telephone number and lo, he called me when I got back. For a while we're here, and without that lubrication, we dry up and poof, become dust. No, I must forget that the camera's there. I'm playing for the camera. <laughs> yeah, and then I taught there, for, uh, you know, until five years ago. No, I, I directed the translation department for some years. And but that was, of course, when I was in France. Yeah, I did, I did a doctor while I, was, uh, while I was over there. That was a nice thing to do, I think. But that was, you see, that was Elizabeth. Uh, was, you know, she kept pushing me and pushing me. Said, you've got to do it. And I said, why? Who cares about a doctor? Or, you know, the attitude of the 50s and 60s, you know, what's all that? Who cares? Rebel against it. It's crap. She said, no, no, someday you'll need it. You know, and she was right, of course. So I stuck to it, but I really didn't feel like it. If she hadn't bugged me, I probably wouldn't have done it. But I certainly thanked her many, 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 many times since. You know, it opened hundreds of doors, especially financial ones. It's amazing, isn't it? You know, at university, what can you do with a, with a, you know, an MA or anything? Who cares? Even now, with a with a PhD, who cares? You've got to have about five, po you know, post PhDs. Then you become vaguely interesting when you get into eight or nine. You know, I went to see, you know, that awful man who was a, a Rambo a Rambo specialist, because as you know, I did my PhD thesis on Rambo and the symbolists. And um, I said, what am I going to do? I, I want to do something nice on this man and something different, something interesting and whatever. And of course, you know, I, I just couldn't think of anything startling. I, you know, everybody keeps working on Rambo and why I did, uh, anyway, I did. Um, so I went to see the Pope of French letters, and that was Etienne. And uh, I went, uh, you know, I finally wrang wangled a, an appointment with him because he was very difficult to see. And finally, I, I saw him, and he was—he kept writing during the whole interview. He kept writing, didn't even look up. And he said, um, "What are your languages?" And I said, uh, well, French, <laughs> yes. Anything else? I said, English, <laughs> yes, anything else? Uh, well, I mean, a smattering of Italian and a smattering of, of Spanish. He said, what, no Urdu? <laughs> and I said, no what? <laughs> and uh, I said, well, not really. He said, look, I'm interested in someone who could do some research on Rambo being translated into Urdu and the, you know, the, the, um, all of that, what that means in, in any region that where Urdu is speak, spoken in, in India. I said, I'm not your man. He said, that's what I thought. Goodbye. End of interview. Of course, he showed up on the, he was on the, uh, the jury. He remembered. You didn't learn Urdu, did you? He said, you just stuck to the old conventional thing of English and French. He did nothing. His students did all of the work. Every last atom of it. You know, it was in a series, which may be still going on today. I haven't investigated for the last two or three years. But at least two, three years ago, it was still going on called Le Mythe de Rimbaud. All of his students did. Well, he's probably been executed by now. Let's hope. 
You know, in the revolution of 68, when the students invaded the, uh, the Sorbonne, they went up and they sought him out and slapped him. They slapped him. Oh, he was, you know, the French are arrogant, but he was the essence of arrogance. You just, well, uh, well, of no. Mais ouvrez un livre, mon pauvre ami. Ouvrez un livre. Lisez quelque chose. Mais qu'est-ce que vous lisez à la fin? Oh, no, no, you want to just strangle them. Terrible man. And, you know, after the soutenance, in, you know, I was exhausted and furious because he just had a festival. Talk about playing for the gallery. You know, it was full of people, the amphitheater, because it was Rimbaud. It wasn't because of Sloat. And he was there, of course, peppering questions, you know, throwing questions at me. And he wouldn't give me a chance to answer them. He'd, add, he'd say, Christus venit. You know the poem, don't you? I said, yes. He said, yes, but you did not know what it meant, did you? And I didn't know what the hell he was talking about. So everybody started, you know, and the audience started chuckling as if they knew anything about it. Just because of his attitude, you know, the arrogant attitude that you obviously have caught you, you know, in some stupid thing. And um, I said, well, uh, do you, and I said, all, all I said was, and he was mad. I said, do you want me to translate it from the Latin into French? You know, and he said, no, no. We said, we all know what it means in Latin. We don't have to translate it. But you see, what did Rimbaud mean by it? I said, I give up. J'abandonne la lutte. He said, it means sexually to come. And I just beamed at him, just smiled at him. I said, yes, it's in my thesis. I did mention that. Anyway. Avoue to his colleague. It was one of the little codes between him and Verlaine, the venet, you know, in, in Latin. Christus venet, well, you know, a good spurt. <laughs> it was spurt. <laughs> I mean, the, what an asshole, you know, coming out like that and just, and especially, you know, when they start doing that with their fingers, you flee, you flee, <laughs> you know, you know you're in for it, you know. Oh. Anyway, he was an awful man. I was wandering home one day across the Tocadero, and there suddenly was this guy sitting on a bench, and uh, and he said hello, and I said hello, and you know, and anyway, we trotted off to his place, had tea and crumpets. What was really strange was, you know, the uh, um, I just sort of grabbed his head, you know, at one time, you know, just to say hello. <laughs> no, I grabbed his head, and it was a wig. And uh, I sort of got dressed and went home. We stayed in touch, but, you know, sexually finito after that one. But he always he had a thing about me. And, uh, you know, we were together for quite a while. And he had wonderful uh, people that he was living with, his aunt and uncle. And, you know, they were, they were wonderful to, to me. And they wanted to set up some sort of apartment for the two of us. You know, because he was so lonely, this poor guy. Poor Michel. And uh, I would have no part of it. But anyway, he finally dedicated this. He was writing that, you know, it was almost suppress when he was, uh, when we met. So he, th he finally did that, thinking that I would, that would just impress me no end. Which it did. I thought it was very nice, but no reason to, you know, to sleep with him anymore after the wig. <laughs> What is in that drink? Guernica powder, eh? Guernica powder. Yes, it is. It's the truth powder. <laughs> I got to get out of here, but I'm in my own home. It's all just nothing but gossip. Yes, but gossip is interesting. Virginia Woolf said that if it weren't for gossip, you know, the life would be so bloody dull. 
And she loved it. She loved gossip. She was always writing letters off to people and saying, have you heard about, you know, have you heard about this? Have you heard about that? And what about so-and-so? What about, you know, she loved it. But, and it's true. I mean, what the hell? Probably all of history is gossip when you think of it. But that's true. You know, that dimension of the gossip and so on, if, if you want to call it that. It is it's true. You'd, any call writer, it, you'd call it. Gossip. But you said that that's what attracted you to a yeah. writer, was yes, gossip. Exactly. Yeah. Hmm. But I wonder what we, yeah, I guess, but gossip always has a pejorative ring to it. You know, it's something. Ah, good. Rumor is nice. Forget it. Let's yeah. call it rumor, like the, or the uh, Latin's call. Yeah. Rumor is nice. Rumor is gossip, right? Rumor is the wind of people speaking. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sound. Yeah. Yeah. It's a sound of, ah, of people talking. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people talk. Yeah. That's right. Anyway, that was that. That was a good old Michel. No, other than that, Antonio, after I came back, um, well, that was before I left, of course, left France. But when I came back, there was, you know, these long years at the university, a sort of stable life, much more stable than uh, it had been in, uh, you know, in France, which was very hectic and very, I should talk about that in more detail sometime, if you like, because there were lots and lots. It was several lifetimes, let's say, you know, but um, Montreal was quite, mm, you know, it was fairly even. It was fairly even. And uh, because, I think probably because of the thread through my life of, of Ken. You know, he, it was there. He was there and uh, he represented stability. And it was a nice thing. There were, uh, you know, weird things that I got into. And, and my habit of picking up stray cats will never end. It started in France, of course. And as my mother, my grandmother said, you know, on her deathbed, she said, Danny, you should be a priest, you know, you should. <laughs> and I said, why, Granny? Because you're interested so much in the downtrodden, in the poor, and those who are hopeless. I said, yeah, well, I'm more hopeless than any of them. That is the attitude that a priest must have. What do you do with that? What do you do with that? You can't win that argument. <laughs> she was a sainted woman. Because they seem lost, and I'm always interested in lost things, lost causes. Isn't that amazing and stupid? You know, you can see some of the, some of the things at, the, at my chalet, some of the plants, some of the trees. They're all trees that I found in the middle of the forest somewhere, and they're all stunted or growing in a weird way, and I lug them back to the chalet, hope that I can make them grow, there's something wrong. It's true, I do that. I've done that with many, many trees. And they, uh, you know, I fiddle with them and turn them, and, uh, and they usually they're okay. And I, then there are all these cats, of course, who are just wandering about through existence without any little bowl of milk until Danny comes along, you see, and says, here's the bowl of milk. And, and there always, there's always a tinge, though, of something a little dangerous about these cats, I've noticed. I think Ken pointed that out. He said, you know, your cats are all, you know, crackpots or jailbirds or a potential jailbirds. And I suspect that that is true. So what do you do with that? Put up with it. Live it and turn that thing off. <laughs> One last drink to that. Thank you. Mm -hmm.